Rachel Fahim is a country pop powerhouse who released the album Iconic in 2019 and the single Darts in the Dark last year. Her latest single is City Girls in the Country and we're going to talk about that and other things. Hi, Rachel. Hey, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. And uh, very much enjoying the new single as I've enjoyed your previous music. So I thought I'd start by asking you, have you been a city girl in the country? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> Short answer, sweet answer. Yes. Um, honestly, I actually feel like um, when I wrote that song uh, with the with the co-writers, we were in the room and it was just a song that I had been wanting to get out for so long because I am, um, I guess, I don't want to say I'm a city girl because I'm not like I live, I live near a city, but I've kind of been trying to say with this song like just because of where I live Mm -hmm. just because it's closer to a city than it is to like rural to a country or anything you know that's country vibes doesn't mean that I I can't do country music Um, so that was kind of like the whole premise behind the song. So when was the song written? Um, Oh we've been sitting on this one for a little while now Um, I want to say it was beginning of the year Mm -hmm. maybe around like January um, but could have it could have even been at the end of 2021. Um, but I've been so excited to finally get it out because I really do feel like it was something I was wanting to say <laughs> and share with the world. Yeah. So when you have a song like that that you that you know, you're happy you've written it and you really want to share it with the world, is it really frustrating to have to wait so long to release it, or does it just build the excitement for you? Oh, that's actually a really good question. I want to say yes it gets very frustrating but at the same time it's kind of good because you get to listen to it over and over and over again Mm -hmm. and not that you don't get sick of the song but you hear all the imperfections when you've sent it to mixing and you've sent it to mastering and um you know it's a it's a finished product you can't really make any changes then but leading up to that point um I like to listen through again and then just kind of make sure I'm happy with all the melodies and the lyrics and getting it to sound just how I want it to sound. So like, I've always wanted to just like write a song and put it out like the next month, but unfortunately I don't think that's possible with the amount of changes that I'm always wanting to make. (laughs) So do you feel that you're quite a harsh self-editor then? Like whenever you do something, you just, I mean, I I hesitate to use the term perfectionist because it's often used in a, in a bad way, but, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, but I'm sorry. That's why I'm saying, do you edit yourself? Yeah. I, um, I don't know. I think, I don't want to say perfectionist either, but I really do think that I like things a certain way. And yeah, I guess I am a bit of a perfection, bit of a perfectionist, especially when it comes to songs that are going to be out and people are going to be listening to them. And it's like a reflection of yourself. You want to be putting the best version of yourself forward. So nothing wrong with that, I don't think. Well, no, and I also think it stems from wanting to do the best thing by the audience. You want to give them a great song. Exactly right. Yeah, totally. And of course, these days with all the connection on social media, they'll tell you quite directly if it's not a, if it's not a song they want. <laughs> yes, they will. <laughs> <laughs> do you get a lot of um, fan interaction on social media? Um, I, I do get quite a few DMs on, on Instagram of people not really saying the nicest things oh. um, or like even on YouTube. But like, I feel like that comes with the good comes with the bad, the bad comes with the good. I get so many more positive messages than I do negative, but yeah, there is something about sitting behind um, the protect protection of your phone or um, as they say, keyboard warriors, mm. something about that. People just think they can just say whatever. And I think as an artist um, in any um, genre or any area whether you're a you know painter or a videographer or a singer like whatever it is people kind of think that they can just say like whatever Mm. and it's not going to upset you or offend you or um you know not going to get to you I Mm. guess just kind of going back to that whole like you know city girls in the country thing um there have been multiple occasions where like I once had somebody um say to me oh, what kind of last name is Fahim for a country music singer? And I was like, what do you mean? Like, would you say that to some, like your friend, to, to their face? Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't understand why people think that they can just say those things and it be okay. Yeah. yeah or even, even remotely approaching logical, because it's not. And you have said, yeah. um, and it's a, a good opportunity to bring up a, co- a quote that, of something you said recently, which was, as a city-born country artist of Lebanese descent, 
I've constantly been challenged about my country music eligibility. But for me, country music has always been a place of storytelling, a platform of the underdog to speak out and a place to connect with real people. And there are a couple of points to talk about in that. But the first of all is that, yeah. that thing that you've just raised of someone saying to you, what sort of last name is that for someone who's in country music? Yeah. I mean, you sound pretty country to me, so it does make me wonder what the eligibility criteria are. Yeah, I'd actually like to see the eligibility criteria. If someone could send that to me, um, that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think there are some struggles that I've definitely faced, um, I guess, as being um, of Lebanese descent. I know I don't look at, I'm so pasty, like <laughs> I'm definitely, I don't tan very well either. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I don't, I think that it's, it's got nothing to do with where you've grown up, what your name, you know, what your last name might be or, you know, anything like the colour of your skin or, you know, what, whatever. It None of that should come into play when you're deciding what kind of person or artist you want to be. Like I don't, don't get why it's questioned. So that was, I guess, a huge like thing pushed behind the song to be like, I'm going to say this and hopefully people resonate. Yeah, because it, it's the subtext of what was said to you is that it's something for Anglo people only. Yeah. And that's completely yeah. ignoring the history of it in the United States when it came from African American musical lineage originally. Yeah. Yeah. It also ignores what happens at a festival like Tamworth. And I'm sure you've seen it go to Tamworth. There are whole lots of people there, and there is no one type of country music fan. Exactly right. Yeah. And I'm loving seeing the diversity because um, I will say, as much as I'm saying everything that I'm saying right now about, you know, inclusivity and all of that. But over the last few years, it's been really great to see more of, um, I don't know, I guess people being more welcoming and accepting of um, artists that aren't, I guess, the mainstream kind of look or sound. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Um, their perception of what fits a country music art. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it is just perception. It's not it really is. Yes. So the second thing out of that quote I wanted to talk about is your description of country music uh, about it being a platform of the underdog and a place of storytelling and connection, because it suggests you have a long love of country music and that, you know, you made a study of the genre to a certain extent, probably as a fan. Who were the artists that first got you interested in country music? Um, so I, I originally did not like country music and I've said that quite a few times so that's not news but like I remember I was when I was younger I would do a lot of talent quests and I would perform around Sydney quite a lot even New South Wales like my mum and I would travel while dad stayed at home with my siblings and mum and I would go around and um we'd yeah I'd do a lot of a lot of gigs and a lot of practice mm -hmm. um and you know what I've actually lost my train of thought <laughs> So, I was, so you didn't originally like country music that's right yeah. and people would always say to me oh your voice is so country and I'm like no it's not like don't no no <laughs> I like pop music but then over time I started kind of getting into it and listening to a lot of artists like Shania Twain um and then Loretta Lynn one of her songs was one of the first songs I ever sang that was like country vibes and um I don't know I just I just started falling in love with it. So I can't really pinpoint one exact artist because it kind of just happened at a time where I was being told you should do country because it would suit you. And so I just did a deep dive and just eventually came around to the idea of, of doing it. And I haven't looked back since. Like I went through a phase where I was like, no, nope, not listening to anything else, just country music. Yeah. <laughs> and even now, like I... I don't know. I feel like it's definitely a bit of an underground world, the genre. Once you're in it, there's so much amazing stuff, but it's just getting past, you know, getting past the surface of what I guess the media makes fun of with country music. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I love it now. It's my favourite genre. Well, and also you say you love pop music explains how you arrived at country pop as the genre. Exactly. <laughs> so, when, so when you first started, uh, well, you've talked about your, someone saying your voice is really suited to country music and you have this fantastic singing voice. So I guess I'll actually backtrack even further and say, when did you start singing? What age? Uh, I started lessons when I was about eight years old mm -hmm. and I'm turning 27 this year. So it's literally been majority of my life that I've been singing um and I know it's so cliche and everyone says it but like I was singing even before then like I think when you're when you're a singer or like a musician you're just born 
into music and it's just um just something you just do because it feels so natural and so normal to you and like the love is there from so young um but when I started lessons that's kind of when it started growing and um yeah becoming a thing yeah. so you said your mum was driving you around to competitions and your father was home with the siblings does that mean none of your siblings is musical like you <laughs> no my sister can uh sing and usually when we're getting ready to go out we'll be in the bathroom just like listening to music and stuff and she is so good at harmonies like she will just start singing a harmony and I've had to like teach myself how to do harmonies because I'm like how do you do that (laughs) like what 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 is that um that was many many years ago but she just has this natural instinct she just doesn't want to pursue it or anything um and my brother I guess I think he actually did try um to do lessons and and pursue a thing with it but I think he lasted like a couple of months and then that was it. He decided it wasn't for him. It's hard work. It's really hard, hard work. Yeah, you got to stick with it. And that's, you know, you were talking before about all the elements that go into producing a song, like mixing, all these sorts of things that happen. When we hear a song, it sounds like, oh, that's a beautiful, complete yeah. piece of work. But there are so many layers to it. There's so much persistence and dedication exactly. behind it to produce those few minutes of song. Exactly. Even before the production, before it goes to mixing and mastering, before you get into the studio, there's years and years and years and years and years of getting that muscle to be uh, strong and, you know, using your diaphragm and getting the breathing right and using the right technique and just so many little things that people don't actually think about when they're like, oh, but you just sing. It's like, well, I don't just sing. It's like, it's a sport. Like, (laughs) Yeah, like I was having with my partner the other day, we were having a conversation about um, who could hold their breath the longest, <laughs> such kids. Um, and he plays soccer, or right. football, soccer, and I obviously sing. And I actually, I think I beat him because I was like, well, I need as much strength in there as I can because I need to jump around on a stage and actually be able to talk and move at the same time where it's like, you just move and kick a ball. Yeah. So like, not not like discrediting how hard that part is, but. Yeah, there's so much. There's so many layers. Oh, look, I always think moving and singing at the same time, um, seeing Dolly Parton on stage where there's all, everything going on, there's movement, yeah. there's singing, there's, and I just, it, yeah, you've got to train for it. It's it is, a lot yeah. of work. Yeah, totally. I think Beyonce, and I would love to get to this stage, but I don't want to do this in public, but I think Beyonce runs on a treadmill and sings at the same time. So... I did read <laughs> something saying that her father used to get her and her sister and Kelly Rowland to, because yeah. Kelly lived with them as kids, to oh, do that when they were kids, basically. So it wow. started early for her, yeah. I didn't know that it was from when they were kids. I thought it was a recent thing. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I need yeah. to do that. <laughs> I think it's a particular Beyonce thing. She could probably have it. Um, but when yes. I was did you um, decide you were going to pursue music professionally? Um, It wasn't really like a decision that was made like black and white kind of thing. It was just that I was doing it so often and I was I was out and about in in the scene that it just kind of happened. Like looking back, I probably would have liked it to be more of a, okay, this is a decision that I'm going to make um, because I probably would have liked to have chosen a stage name instead of using my legal name um, and kind of think about it more as like a business um, and a brand rather than just kind of going from really enjoying music to oh, it's a career now. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, I wouldn't change anything. And obviously everything happens for a reason. And I, you know, I've just stuck with it that long that it's just become, become my career. So love it. And when you talk about choosing a stage name, is that so you could have like the different gears? So you could be one version of Rachel and then (laughs) different ones. I've, I've thought about what I would probably like, what stage name I would probably choose. Um, and like, to be honest, it's actually so difficult. So I don't know how a younger version of me would have come up with something like cool and relevant and like easy, but I think it would be actually very nice for me to have that separation, Mm -hmm. to be able to be like, you know what, I'm on stage and I'm this person. And then I come off and I go home and I switch off and I'm someone else. I'm me. Um, I think it's really easy to kind of. I feel like I'm always on, like I'm always on show. Like no matter where I go, I feel like I've always got to be um, cautious of 
I guess what I do and how I say, well, like how I act and what I say. And not that I'm ever like acting inappropriate or saying rude things, but like, it's just always in the back of my mind that my name is my name. Right. Um, for everyone and everything. Yeah. <laughs> Much to it. Well, especially, I guess, when people have mobile phones, they can tag you on all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that is a burden that didn't exist 10 years ago, actually. Yeah, it, that's very true. Yeah. And with the with like all this security stuff that's going on at the moment, mm-hmm. it's like, do I really want my legal name to be like everywhere? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I know. There's a lot to worry about, Rachel, which is why I we need know. fantastic music to help us figure out this. <laughs> help us so, um, and what, um, what stage did you start songwriting? I... I think I wrote my first song when I was in, I want to say in primary school. Um, It was very, very bad. I could not sing any of it. I could not even tell you what it was called, but I just remember showing my sister and she laughed at me. (laughs) She was like, that's so bad. I was like, wow, thanks for keeping me humble, bringing me right back down. (laughs) But um, yeah, I think it's, it's always just been something that, um, you know, I've wanted to work on and, you know, from a young age, I just, thought I'd I'd give it a crack and yeah I don't know kept writing and it's a bit better now (laughs) I'd say it's it's more than a bit better now um (laughs) not that I heard your early work but I'm wondering just go back to what you said earlier about um as I said the self-editing process Mm. that apply to songs that you're going to release do you have a whole brace of songs that 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 you, you choose from and you're really ruthless about what you choose to record Yeah, I have a few songs that I'm definitely um, feeling like I'm advocating for really, really strong because I'm like, I want these songs to come out and I feel so confident that because I relate to them, that people are going to relate to them. Mm -hmm. Um, But then there's other songs that I'm like, oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that was just, you know, something that I needed to get out, obviously, and it's probably never going to see the light of day. But um, the whole songwriting thing is really, for me, I just, like getting out the things that I'm feeling and things that I'm saying. And I've been really, um, really strong in the way of whatever merch I put out, whatever songs I put out, it has to be true to me. And it has to be something that I would want to listen to or that I would want to wear or, you know, like I feel like it's, that's really important to me. So any song that I write, I do overanalyze and think, okay, as a consumer, like, would I listen to this? And right. Yes, and yes. If no, then probably not. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it sounds like you are quite ruthless with yourself, and that's not a bad thing because it does yeah. mean you that each song you put out is great. So on your album, yeah, it's not like there was a dead song there. They yeah, were all really good. <laughs> so, but I would also think that sometimes you can. It, it can be frustrating for yourself. You know what I mean? Like it's like, oh, yeah. when do I stop self editing? Exactly. Yeah, I know it's hard to switch it off because you want everything to be good. <laughs> Well, and I think that's, you know, that is reasonable. And it, as I said, does result in a great product and also results in things like you getting into Star Maker and in fact, winning Star Maker as you did in 2017. And that is quite a process. You know, you have to go through early rounds and then judges select you. And it's not just based on how well you sing or how well you perform. It's what stage of career you are at. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what was the process like for you? So I entered Star Maker when I when it was 2015. That was the first year. And then I entered again in 2017. So the first year um, wasn't ready. And that's very evident to me now. Um, so I didn't, didn't place, but I made the top 10 and it was a great experience. And I really got to see how they worked the competition and I guess what the requirements were and, you know, got the feel, you know, mm-hmm. I, I could do this again and I know what to expect next time. Then 2017 rolled around, I entered and it was just a whirlwind. Like you'd go from interview to interview to performance to interview again to it was just like bam, 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 just like hit you really hard. And just I think they just wanted to see how people dealt with the pressure and um, how like, I don't know, I think it was just trying to gauge every person's like level of um, dedication and Mm -hmm. maybe the professionalism side of it, because you really do have to try and present yourself in a way that's like, no, I can do this. Like if you win star maker, you've got to be like 12 months down the track. You're doing everything from like all the festivals and yeah, it's um, they really just test, test your limits. And it it was awesome. And I loved it. And I 
yeah, I would, if I could do it again, I would, I would definitely right. do it again. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, and in terms of, of, of all the stuff you have to pack into 12 months, Max Jackson, who's a current yeah. star maker, I just look at her Instagram and it looks pretty tiring. Yeah, no, she's killing it. I'm seeing all her posts as well. And she's like here and there and it's awesome. It's a great, great platform. Yeah. Now you are also Australia's second most streamed female country artist of all time. The number one person is Casey Chambers. That's quite a person to come second to. And there are over yeah. 17 million streams of your music across past singles. Is it hard to wrap your head around a number like that? It is. Yeah. Um, every time I hear like, hear someone say it or like if I read it somewhere like yes it's an interview that I'm doing but even then it's still like oh wow it's a really good reality check to be like you know what you're really hard on yourself sometimes but you know don't be so hard on yourself because people people appreciate what you're doing and and they obviously listen so it feels really good yeah it's it's an amazing achievement because there are there are a lot of songs out there on streaming platforms and I think discoverability is hard in any kind of creative pursuit whether it's music books um films tv shows so yeah that's incredible and in fact my next question was does it create any kind of pressure when you're thinking about what you release next and I think you perhaps (laughs) answer that yeah 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 um I don't know I try not to think about that side of things too much like the the pressure of it because in the end like I'm going to release the songs that I like Mm -hmm. or that I love and um, as much as I want it to do as well as the last one did, that's not that's not always going to happen. So, um, yeah, kind of just got to do what do what I feel is right and let it happen, let it roll. Yeah, and keep the connection to the songs, as you said, that exactly. you would want to listen to, and then they're more yeah. likely to resonate. Yeah, exactly right. So you are performing at Capital Country in December, um, which was postponed from earlier in the year. What it, what's happening after that? Are you heading to Tamworth? Um, so I don't actually know if I'm heading to Tamworth uh, next year. I haven't locked anything in, but there's a few conversations that uh, my management team and I are having with some people. So hopefully something gets locked in. Um, but I've actually just finished going kind of around, um, I want to say New South Wales, but it was actually Queensland as well. So I finished a whole bunch of festivals and shows Mm -hmm. and that's kind of it until, until the end of the year. And then we've started working with a new agent. So I'm hoping that we get, we get more festivals and and gigs locked in. Um, I don't know. It's a bit nerve wracking when you start working with new people, but yeah, should be good. I'm definitely going to be putting things up on socials when, um, when gigs confirmed. Fantastic. And any new singles tentatively in the pipeline? Yep, I'm actually jumping in the studio next week to record my next one. And then we've got the next few ready to go. So there's a lot coming very, very soon. Great. Well, that is very exciting news. I'm sure your fans will be streaming. (laughs) More millions of streams to add to the ones you have. (laughs) It was lovely to talk to you. Thanks for talking to me. Thank you so much for having me.